Well, good evening and welcome to Trinity English Lutheran Church. I am Gary Erdis. I'm a senior pastor here. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Uh, I'll be trying to read in your respect all So <laughs> it's great, though, to see you. It's kind of, you know, it's a pleasant surprise. As we begin, uh, Justin Johnson from yep. University of St. Francis. Uh, this Sunday, I elevated him to PhD, but there, yeah, so. So, um, are any of you who are with us this evening Orthodox? Very good, very good. Well, that, that means I have to be careful as to what I say exactly. But one of the things I want to offer to you is that when I was in seminary, I had the opportunity to be in school in Boston. And in Boston, there is a seminary called the Holy Cross. It's a Greek Orthodox school. And it's the only place in the world where non-Orthodox students are permitted to take classes. And so I did my liturgics at the Holy Cross 900 years ago. Uh, when I was there, and it does feel like 900 years ago. But when we were there, we were there, one of the things that I had the opportunity to learn a little bit about was iconography. Because in the Orthodox tradition, of which Justin is going to touch a little bit about, it's, it's hard for us who grew up in what is called the Western Church. That means Roman Catholics and Protestants. We grew up in the Western Church. We have a completely different understanding about this sort of thing. We learned, if we learned anything about it, so that it's art and that it's religious art. But in the Orthodox tradition, icons are not just art. Icons have the status, at least in some traditions, of the church. So uh, of the same status that we talk about as the Bible. And that sounds weird to Orthodox. It sounds weird to Protestants who have been schooled in, you know, Bible, 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 Bible is the only revelation of God that we have. When the Orthodox tradition, that's not quite so. Like they're talking about this is a revelation of God. And so when you're looking at these pictures, and Justin's going to do this job of helping us interpret as if we were interpreting the Bible, how to look at this. And it gives you an experience of God. And we all know words are not the only way God communicates with us. And so this opportunity tonight, and this relates to then some of the art that is here at Trinity for the next couple of months, and so what, how you can then begin to interact both with the art, but also with the very traditional like us. That, that as you're there, they are revealing and telling us something about God. There's an interesting, we could go on for a couple of hours, but there's this interesting moment in church history where it's called the iconoclast controversy about what can be icons, what can't be icons, what you can look at, what you can't look at, very divisive moment in Christianity. But what you're going to hear about tonight is ways of fundamentally talking about God and seeing God. And in a way, I hope when Justin's done and when we're done with you here, you see God and each other in a new way. So, have at it. Thank you, Reverend. Um, well, thank you for, the, for that poignant introduction because uh, I, I am always uncomfortable talking about icons, uh, specifically because I, I have not spent my career in theology, um, but I do feel that I, I have a distinct and amazing uh, love and affinity for, uh, for I, icons, iconography, and sacred art. This is something that I've studied even as a young artist growing up um, in the small town of Garrett. Is anyone from Garrett? This evening, nobody. So, um, so again, I'm not a theologian. Um, I'm an artist, and I interpret sacred art, uh, specifically artistically, but even more so personally through my own faith. Um, when Rebecca reached out to to the University of Saint Francis, and we met, um, you know, I I. Uh, I sort of had an inkling as to the undertaking this, uh, that this exhibition would, would be. Because uh, the university, we've done some exhibitions of this magnitude. And, and uh, I want to commend um, Reverend uh, Gary and, and also the senior pastor, as well as Rebecca Karcher, because um, for a 
church congregation that is not bringing in exhibitions all the time, you guys really jumped off the deep end. Um, <laughs> and I sort of saw it coming, uh, and I was glad that you had about two weeks to pull it off and not two days. Uh, so I commend uh, your congregation for the investment that you've made to bring this exhibit to the community. I've seen it three or four times and I'm just in awe of it. Um, and I hope that the community can see this. Uh, I, I would love to see the children in your children's ministry interpret these works and see them in terms of the color, the texture, the, uh, the expression that is found in these works. Um, so again, I, I wanna commend uh, Trinity English Lutheran Church for, for bringing this exhibition to the community. Um, also, uh, sadly, the artist uh, Ludmila Pulowski uh, can't be here this evening. She's obviously somewhere else, but I think that we can all see a lot of her in these works that she's shared with us. Um, I've just got one shameless plug for the university, but if you are moved by this exhibition, um, in late fall, our university is putting together an exhibition of interpretations of the nativity. Uh, it'll be the 800th anniversary of St. Francis of Assisi uh, creating the first living nativity in, in, in Assisi. And so we will be bringing in uh, over 30 regional artists to interpret the nativity in, in, in a contemporary way, as well as uh, intermingling historic examples of nativities and earlier examples of nativities, so from around the world. Uh, so it, it again, uh, if, if you like this exhibition, that would be one to, to mark your calendars for. Um, so this evening, uh, obviously, uh, showing every icon that's ever been created is impossible. So I'm dialing it down mainly to two. Um, but I think from understanding these two works, it can give everyone here uh, the ability and, and the way to, in which to interpret these icons more intuitively and through their own faith. Um, if we can move to, okay. So the, the first image that I'm gonna sh going to show, and, and I realize like we have people in the back who may not be able to see, so if you're able to write down a few notes, um, I'm also releasing this PowerPoint and slide presentation to the, to the church so you can reference it that way. Um, icons find their, find their predecessors in the fam portraits of Egypt. Um, and, and when you think about the Hebrews in captivity in Egypt, a lot of the culture of Egypt interplays into early Christianity, into Coptic, uh, Coptic Christianity. And so um, this man with sword belt is a fam portrait that would have been done uh, during the entombment of this, of this person. There were uh, hundreds of these created within the Fayum uh, region, um, and, and they've uniquely survived partly because of the climate. They, uh, it was just kind of a perfect climate, so they look almost like they did in an original sense. Um, the reason why I bring this up is that when you look at the eyes, they have this distortion, and eyes are very specific to icons. When you look at the eyes of the figure within the icons, they are meant to be a portal. Uh, there's an abstraction to them. And, I, and when I interpret these fan portraits, I see a similar abstraction. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, so this is the oldest icon uh, that's documented currently. This is Christ Pentocrator, which is from the sixth century, uh, and it's located at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. Um, within the exhibition here at Trinity, there are several versions of Christ Pentocrator, and, and also where the artist has cropped in the eyes as a way of showing the eye's spirituality. Uh, they also act as portals. And so um, this image of Christ Pentocrator acted as an early template uh, to stay within that, that um, concept of, of recreating these icons. So one thing that is fairly well known is, is obviously there's been artists for centuries that faithfully duplicate these icons, these templates, much the way as though people have been rewriting, not rewriting, but, but uh, you know, retyping the Bible, rewriting the Bible 
for centuries that it, it's looked upon the same way. And so this, again, is a perfect example of the image of Christ um, uh, as the template for Christ Pentagrater. Next slide. Um, this is a pretty unique icon and presumably uh, was painted by St. Luke. Now, um, that really, you've got to go pretty far back to be able to trace that. But anyways, this is the Solus Populi Romani, uh, which is located at Santa Maria Maiore in Rome, Italy, um, in the Basilica. Um, it's in a huge altar. Um, it's pretty incredible. But um, this, again, is one of the earliest templates for the mother and child of Mary holding Christ as an infant. You see Christ um, with uh, his right two fingers, again, blessing uh, those that see this icon. Um, again, within the exhibition, uh, the artist brought contemporary uh, paintings of these very specific templates. Um, and then there's also historic examples that go back to the 18th, 19th century that are also duplicating these templates. So um, there are several uh, Madonnas, uh, mother and childs, uh, you could also call them Theotokos from the Greek Orthodox, uh, the mother of gods, um, uh, throughout the exhibition uh, that, that you can see. And, and within the Russian Orthodox faith, so many of these icons of the mother of God tie into specific towns, locations that reference the miracles that these icons are connected to. Next slide. Uh, this is, again, a, a very important icon, the Virgin of Vladimir. Uh, it's unknown who actually painted it, although it's interesting to me that they don't know the artist, but they know when it was done, which to me doesn't, it's tough to connect those dots, but uh, bear with me. Um, it was created in Constantinople, brought to Russia, and it's located in a secret passage between uh, the Tretyakov Gallery and St. Nicholas Church in Moscow. Um, I mentioned Tretyakov Gallery because it plays a specific role in the next icons that we'll be looking at. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, there, there are numerous depictions of the Mother of God within the exhibition. Um, and I, I don't have an image of this, but in one of the displays of the historical icons, there's an icon of four Mother of Gods that are specific to four different towns that surround um, uh, a crucifixion. And so those really tie in. And um, what I like most about, or am drawn most to the Virgin of Vladimir, is the intimacy of, the ch of Christ the child touching uh, Mary's face. So if you can see that, I know it's, it's tough um, with some in the back, but this is one of the few where Christ's face is actually touching Mary's, and there's a, a distinct in intimacy that, that, again, would have influenced uh, later artists in the Renaissance as well as uh, throughout the history of art. Next slide. So the two icons that I'm going to talk about, and, and I'm sort of... Um, sort of bending the rules a little bit. Uh, the first is the Old Testament Trinity. Just by a show of hands, how many of you are aware of the Old Testament Trinity? Uh, a few, a few, one, huh? a few, okay. Well, just to preface the Old Testament Trinity by Andrei Rublev, this is the masterpiece of the Ro Russian Orthodox faith. Um, if you want to really know how important icons are to the Orthodox faith, this is the gateway. The Old Testament Trinity by Andrei Rublev. Um, this is on par with the Sistine Chapel or the works of da Vinci or um, even within this last century of the works of the major works of Picasso. I mean, this is in the canon of the most important works in history and sadly, because it's a Russian Orthodox icon, it's very unknown. It's not taught a lot within Western art, um, but it is highly um, sophisticated in its design. And when we talk about the controversy of illustrating God as God, rather than God the Son or God as the Holy Spirit, 
this Trinity is able to follow the text of the Bible and illustrate that without creating controversy, which I think also really plays to the importance of it as a work of art. Um, to tell you a little bit about Andrei Rublev, which will take me about 10 seconds because very little is known, uh, he was a monk, uh, lived from uh, 1360 to 1430. And he obviously had talent as an artist. Um, and what helped was that within the monastery where he was, he uh, studied under Theophanes the Greek, who again is a major figure within the Orthodox tradition. Um, and was connected to the Novgorod school. So if you're familiar with the high renaissance of Italian art, the Novgorod school is considered the high renaissance of Russian icon painting. Um, all of the templated icons that you see in this exhibition are offshoots of the Novgorod school. Yes, and I did walk through. I don't believe there's any, any painted versions of the Old Testament Trinity that I could find. No. There isn't? Okay. Now there is, I saw, I'd have to dig, but I do remember seeing um, the artist, she um, will embed small little metal medallions into the works, little icons, and there are examples of the Old Testament Trinity in that capacity uh, in the exhibition. Um, this, in terms of the circa date, which is going to be very important in terms of the next uh, work of art that we look at, it, it's either roughly 1408 to roughly 1425-27. Um, the location of this, obviously, uh, we're not traveling to Russia in the current state of things. Um, but for decades, since the early 1900s, it had been protected within the Tretikov Gallery which is the major gallery in Moscow, uh, comparable to the Louvre, um, that holds all the major works of the Orthodox faith. Next slide. So here is the Tretigov Gallery with the Old Testament Trinity on the, on the right. It's a fairly large icon. Um, Rublev did not create very many works that are truly documented by him. Um, these in this room, they, they attribute that at least he helped on some of these icons, but it is pretty factual that he did create the Old Testament Trinity. Um, so you see that in the case to the right, the vitrine. And unfortunately, due to the state of politics, um, and, and this is pretty common in the history of art, um, a certain, uh, I'm not gonna get too political, but a certain dictator in Russia took this amazing work of art that had been protected for hundreds and hundreds of years and moved it, if you can move to the next slide, to the um, Cathedral uh, of, the, of Christ the Savior in Moscow. And now you see it flanked by two um, military personnel. And it is what it is. This is not the first time in history that something like this has happened. You can look at World War II, you can look at almost every war, these things happen. But uh, Vladimir Putin has taken the Old Testament Trinity out of the Trechikov Gallery and moved it into this church. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, sadly, again, when you move priceless works like this out of where they had been protected, you really, risk damaging the wood, the paint. Um, these icons are very, very fragile. You can see the historical ones in the cases. These things have lasted fairly well over 200 years, but they're still pretty fragile. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so again, I'll get back to the, the, um, the symbolism and theology found in, in the Old Testament Trinity. So. The, the Old Testament Trinity, in terms of the narrative, is based on the hospitality of Abraham, which is found in Genesis 18, 1 through 8. Uh, it mentions three angels are greeted by Abraham and Sarah and presented a meal. The angel states to Sarah, she'll soon give birth to a son. 
Now, just in that small paraphrase, this is not the whole, uh, all the verses, which, which I'll get to in the next slide. Um, it mentions first the three angels, but then in the second statement, it says the angel, and that gives Rublev the opportunity to define the three as one, as the Trinity. Um, this meal that's presented to the three angels is a prophecy of the birth of Christ, as well as the crucifixion and his resurrection. Does anyone know Genesis 18 by heart? Nobody? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, so um, just in terms of time, I'm not going to go through all this, but there's one, um, there's one statement in verse 3 where, again, it can be interpreted as Abraham greeting these three angels as one. It says in verse 3, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Um, and I apologize, I did not capitalize Lord, um, which is on, on my shoulders. But um, within this passage, there are specific instances where Abraham intentionally responds to these three angels or greets these three angels as one. He doesn't mention them as a group. He specifically mentions them as one. So the, the, Rublev is interpreting these three as one as a form of the Trinity. Next slide. So, when we, when we begin to interpret the icon itself, we're able to see all the symbolism that Rublev gave to us in terms of understanding what's what within the picture plane. I've divided this image into three parts, partly to, again, help us kind of interpret it as well. One thing that, again, for those of you in the back, um, it's going to be pretty tricky to decipher this from this far of a distance, even if you're looking at the original. Um, it's so patina that it's very difficult to see. But in the first, uh, on the left side, you have Abraham's house in the upper left-hand corner. So that is above the left angel. The center angel is under the Oak of Mamre, which is mentioned specifically within the, the text. The right angel is under, the, uh, under Mount Moriah, which would have been the location of where um, Abraham was at that time. They're seated at a table, which could be interpreted as the tabernacle, with a cup with the head of a calf. Um, if we go to the next slide. So now we begin with just these clues to piece together the angels as the Holy Trinity. So we can interpret God the Father on the left side being under his house, the church. The Son, uh, Jesus Christ, under the tree of Ma the oak of Mamre as the tree of life, but also as a uh, precursor to the crucifixion. Then the third angel on the right uh, is pictured as the Holy Spirit under the mountain as a symbol of spiritual ascension. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. Um, and again, this image is very easy to find. Uh, so again, I would highly encourage you afterward either to come up and look at this on screen or just seek it out online. It's, it's very easy. Or go to the library. I mean, it's very widely published. The last thing I mention, which again ties this all together, is the cup, which is again a symbol of communion as well as the Eucharist as the body and blood of Christ. And if you look with the cup being center, it's directly underneath uh, this, uh, God, God the Son uh, as Jesus Christ. Next slide. So hopefully um, this is visible. Um, what I've done is I've created a triangle between the three portraits of the uh, angels as well as a vertical line uh, tracking directly down to the cup. So Again, in terms of interpreting this, Rublev directly posed these angels specifically to again engage us in understanding who's who within the icon. 
So the left angel is God the Father who looks to his son, his right hand blessing the cup. The son looks back to his father, his right hand also blessing the cup because he was actively involved within um, the crucifixion, resurrection, the last supper, all that tied together. He's the direct connection to that cup. The Holy Spirit looks at both the Father and Son, also blessing the cup, connecting the two. Does that make sense to everybody? Am I keeping it? Okay. Um, and again, I, I, I want to do pre preface this that I, I am not a theologian. I am only interpreting this as an artist, and so bear with me. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is the game changer to me. This, when, when I was doing the research on the Old Testament Trinity during my master's study, this is what really I was like, this is pretty amazing. That an artist in the early 1400s designed this in such a way that there's all this layered symbolism in terms of not only the, narr the narrative involved, but also the geometry involved, which we're gonna go into as well. So, um, if you can see, the way that Rublev has designed this is that there's a curved composition that then encloses the three symbols at the top, the church, the tree, and the mountain. That creates the first cup as it goes down to the tabernacle and where the cup is located. The second cup is specifically designed with the three angels uh, enclosing the cup, and then the third cup is the cup, okay? Um, so in Genesis 18, 1 through 8, it's an Old Testament prophecy describing Christ, the Son of God, and his resurrection within the New Testament. Next slide. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the color, that Rublev intentionally uh, colorized the robes and these figures to interplay and create this equalness, this oneness of all three as one, as the Trinity. So we have God the Father, and the first robe that he's enclosed with is a gold robe, which represents his divineness. Then underneath that gold robe is a blue robe that represents the Holy Spirit and of heaven where he is within. So the gold is what you see first, his under robe is blue. And you'll see how this connects as I talk about the other two. Then what's unique is that the green is reflected into the gold. You go to the sun, Jesus Christ, his blue robe is on the outside, meaning that when he was on earth, he was experiencing the Holy Spirit directly. The crimson robe that he has which is underneath that is directly associated with his body is a reference to his sacrifice as well as the tabernacle. But there's also a gold um, sash similar to the Fayum portrait that we saw in the first slide uh, that connects him also to the divinity of his father. But there's also a green reflection that is, that is reflected into the blue. So in the first two, we see all four of those colors, blue, gold, green, and crimson uh, reflected in, into each other. Crimson is not included in God the Father, partly because he was not directly in conjunction with the crucifixion itself. If you go to the Holy Spirit on the right, the Holy Spirit is clothed in the blue robe, which is a representative of the Holy Spirit, and the green, which represents everlasting life. So, the Holy Spirit is reflecting in both God the Son and God the Father. Next slide. So, we go to the geometric symbolism of the Trinity as three. Next slide. So, first, we have the circle, which is a symbol of eternal life and everlastingness. And you can see how the first circle connects uh, Christ's hand with the cup, then it's extended to where it shows all three hands, and then it's extended around the three figures themselves, the three angels. Next slide. Then we have the, the design of the octagon, which also includes the church, 
the tree, and the mountain. Um, it's a mix of a circle and a square, which is again a symbol of Christ's resurrection. Also, if you're familiar with baptismal fonts, those are usually designed as an octagon, as a symbol of the Christian faith uh, in terms of the New Testament, where Jesus rose on the eighth day, and also from the Old Testament, which is the day after the Jewish Sabbath. Um, so again, we see how he intentionally designed this not only circularly, but also within the form of an octagon, which when you're trying to design as an artist, it's much easier to design circles than octagons within the, within the picture plane. Next slide. This is a reference to 1 Peter 3.20, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. Um, there again, is that symbol of eight, which is uh, connected from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Next uh, slide. So I went through all that very, very quickly because we still have another famous work of art to talk about. But um, one of the most important essays on this um, is by Alexander Volizhinov. Um, it's called The Old Testament Trinity of Andrei Rublev, Geometry and Philosophy. Uh, it was published by MIT Press in 1999. And it talks about each of these types of symbolism, the symbolism found in the Old Testament Trinity. But he and also other mathematicians actually went in and physically measured this out in terms of the theological mathematics of this image. Um, now that's where, as a visual artist, I, it went way over my head because I, I couldn't connect the X's and the Y's and the fractions and all that. But, um, that shows just how complex this image was by a 15th century monk in Russia. So um, now we're going to get to another, another artwork that, that all of you might be more aware of. We'll, we'll see um, if we can go to the next slide. So again, I'm bending the rules a bit because I went from talking about Russian icons to an image within the, the Italian Renaissance. So bear with me. Um, so this is an important work. And the reason why I wanted to share it is that it was done at almost the same exact time period as Rublev's uh, when it was created. Uh, this is the Holy Trinity by Masaccio. And it was created roughly between the years of 1425 and 1427, the Basilica of Santa Maria Novella in Florence, Italy. The reason why I tie these two together in terms of understanding how to interpret works of art is that both Andrei Rublev, who is located in Moscow, and Masaccio, who's located in Florence, Italy, had no connection to one another. Uh, these artists would have been very isolated and would have been, again, working within the churches where they were being apprenticed and commissioned to work. Um, now, Masaccio, had the, um, the foundations of earlier artists, but I'm gonna show you how he was just as transcendent as Rublev in terms of de defining uh, his artwork within the Italian Renaissance. Um, Masaccio is widely considered to be the founding father of the Renaissance. So whenever you hear the Renaissance, you automatically think of Michelangelo and da Vinci. Well, Michelangelo apprenticed in Santa Maria Novella and as a young artist, studied this altar in particular. So I don't think we would have Michelangelo if not for Masaccio about 50 years before that. So um, again, we're, we're going to look at the symbolism and the geometry of this image in conjunction with the Old Testament Trinity that we, look, we just looked at. And again, I wanna mention that, again, for these artists, uh, showing God the Father was really, really risky. Um, you could be charged with as much as heresy uh, or be uh, alienated outside the church. Um, so again, both artists um, intuitively were able to find ways to again define all three as one. Um, and I think that's very important in terms of the narrative. Um, as I mentioned before, Masaccio uh, lived a very brief life, 1401 to 1428, 
And like Rublev, there aren't a lot of examples of his work. Um, the Trinity being probably the most important, as well as the Brancacci Chapel in Florence, which I'll talk about at the very end. Um, I think it's also important to understand that Michelangelo, it's pretty well documented that he would have studied this work in particular while he apprenticed at the church. And as you'll see, and I'll emphasize this, much like Rublev bringing a humanness and emotion and delicateness to his images and to his figures, especially these three angels that we talked about, Rublev, Rub, not Rublev, Masaccio is the, one of the first artists to truly bring a realism and three-dimensional uh, perspective to a two-dimensional flat plane, and that, that I'm going to talk about as well. So both Masaccio and Rublev are, are really the, the founding fathers of modern art in terms of how, how it's, it was created at that time period. Next slide. So um, this is the interior of Santa Maria Novella um, in Florence, and you can't see this, but I just want to show you the atmosphere of the church. Um, this altar, the Trinity by Masaccio, is on the left-hand side. Uh, next slide. And this is how you see it, um, you know, if you were to see it today. Um, the thing, and I'm not going to go far into this, but this, this Trinity, uh, this altarpiece was hidden for centuries and was found, I think, in the 16 or 1700s. And so that's why it seems so isolated, is that um, they, the, the church wasn't even aware that it even still existed. Um, and so once they did find it and found the perspective that he used, uh, how realistically these figures were interpreted at that time, it, it really is an important work. Next slide. So the way that this is designed is in three levels. The narrative symbolism begins in the bottom portion with a tomb. Uh, laying on the tomb is a skeleton, and I'm sure that you've heard this statement, what you are, I once was, what I am, you will be. That is inscribed above the, the uh, skeleton. Uh, and it's a traditional memento mori, which is a remembrance of death. Uh, that's a whole nother lecture in and of itself. Um, but basically, throughout the Renaissance, uh, you go into Dutch and Flemish painting, uh, they, they always slide in a skull. Uh, Holbein's, or Holbein, is it Holbein's ambassadors? Um, that, uh, you know, with the skewed skull where you can only see it if you, like, look at the very side of the painting. Um, those sorts of things, but... <laughs> oh, perfect, perfect. Perfect. Uh, next, next slide. So the bottom plane, and this image is divided into three planes to again emphasize the, th the trinity. The bottom plane is, defines mortality of death. The middle plane is the mortal world. Now, there is not definitive documentation of who the two figures are kneeling above the skeleton. The best that can be attributed is that it was Domenico, Lindsay, and his wife, or possibly the Berte family. That, that is documented from church records from 2012 that, that were found. Um, again, this isn't something like you can just get online and find out who's who in these things. So, um, Anyways, uh, there, there are two figures that are kneeling in front of Mary and St. John. Uh, and they're in the middle plane, which is representative of the present and the world in which we live. Um, if we can go back two slides to the, where it's located. Okay, so you see the scale of this, and that's also very important. Um, the image of the present world and the image of death, there's, there's a space. And most viewers, their eye level hits right in the middle between the two. Okay, if we can go on past to the next, okay. Um, so the, the mortal world, uh, the world in which we live, uh, there's also the image of Mary, the mother of God, and St. John the Evangelist. Um, both Mary and John were at the foot of the cross, and John became Christ's adoptive brother as the only apostle at the foot of the cross. Christ's body flanks both 
the mortal and the eternal. So the way that the middle portion is defined is that you have the two donors who paid to have this created. They're outside of the altar itself, whose inside the altar is Mary and St. John, uh, flanking Christ. Now what's also intuitive on Masaccio's part is that he has Christ flanking both the mortal and eternal world obviously, for obvious reasons. Next slide. So the narrative symbolism in the top plane is the eternal world. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One thing that you cannot see in this slide, but it is there, and, and I've seen it enough times that um, it is there, is between the head of God the Father and God the Son is a dove that connects the two. And so that's uh, the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove. Mary and John flank the mortal and inter eternal world due to their, rela their relationship with Christ. The dove connects the Father and Son as the Holy Spirit. Next slide. Okay, so what made this image such a game changer is that prior to this, and even when you're at the church, you see paintings that were being done at the same time period that were very flat, very geometric, and really followed the templates and canons of traditional Orthodox icons. These would have been the works of, uh, that, that were, um, that influenced the works of uh, the Russian Orthodox faith, the Greek Orthodox faith, that go back to the Byzantine uh, period of time with regards to Christ Pentocrator that we saw at the beginning, or uh, the, Madonna, the Madonna image by St. Luke. So Masaccio was the, f the first artist to really successfully bring two-dimensional perspective into the picture plane. And what makes this even more unique is that the vanishing point, so if you can imagine perspective, so if you're looking down a, a long highway into the horizon, you'll come to a vanishing point. Well, he made that vanishing point decisive in that it's at the viewer's eye. So if you're looking at this, you are playing an active role in the image, um, which again, I think is very intuitive. Um, so if you look at the perspective, your eye first flanks out to the two donors, then your eye goes into the altar and begins to visualize Mary, uh, John, and then uh, Christ, and then the Father in the back. And then it's emphasized with the aerial perspective of the, of the chapel, the, the altar that, that's uh, designed. Next slide. Geometric symbolism. Uh, the donors uh, visually connect to Mary and St. John and to Christ outside the vault. Uh, that's very important because those donors would have probably ticked off most of their congregation if they had put themselves within the space of, of the Trinity. Uh, Mary and St. John are located within the vault and are directly connected to Christ and to God the Father. Uh, that is because, again, uh, within... Uh, the passage of the crucifixion, it's, it's definitive of how Mary and St. John are connected. Next slide. Um, so the geometric symbolism in terms of the Trinity, if we zoom in, uh, there's a composition that has been designed with Mary and St. John at the bottom, and then this triangle that connects them to Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father. Um, it, it, and the other thing that I want to, to express is, again, how the dove is slightly off-center, which creates an additional focal point for the viewer to kind of dial into. Next slide. So in terms of color, similar to what I talked about in regards to Rublev's Old Testament Trinity, where each robe is colored specifically in terms of creating uh, a unification between the three. So those colors were repeated, but interchanged throughout the three angels. The same occurs within uh, the Trinity by Masaccio in terms of how he uses red and blue. So if you start from the uh, top, you have God the Father with red, which is representative of the sacrifice of his own son and as the symbol of the Eucharist, and, and he's also wearing a blue robe, which ties to the Holy Spirit. The Son 
uh, and I'm putting the Holy Spirit in parentheses, is draped with a white cloth that represents, obviously, um, you know, sanctity and innocence, uh, but also repeats and connects itself to the dove, which again is an aspect of the Holy Spirit. Mary is draped in blue, connecting to heaven and the Holy Spirit. St. John is draped in red, connecting to the sacrifice of Christ and as the apostle who was at the cross. So if you see, the colors are interchanged from left to right, left to right, which again creates kind of a crisscross and triangular effect. Next slide. Color. Donors also connect to Mary and St. John as well, but, but they are connected by, their, um, by the male donor connecting to red as with St. John, and then the, the female, the wife, is draped in blue connecting to Mary. So again, they're, they're an opposite contrast to Mary and John, which again creates that, that crisscross pattern as you move through the composition. Next slide. So this is something that, again, isn't truly documented, but you can see it fairly visually, is this stairway to eternal life. So if you look at this from a perspective standpoint, you begin at the image of the, the skeleton. And if you think of that as the first step, you then can visually, through perspective, create the stairway all the way to the Trinity. Next slide. So, again, if you're interested in, in learning more about the Trinity, the best, uh, the best essay uh, or group of essays is by Rona Goffin uh, from Cambridge University Press in 1998, uh, where she defines, as well as several other uh, art historians, how important the Trinity is within not only Western art, but within the canons of world art. Next slide. So, uh, in closing, um, I want to again uh, emphasize Rublev's old Holy Trinity because um, his Old Testament Trinity, um, and both are titled kind of interchangeably. Um, again, to me, it's very, very sad that he's kind of on the outskirts of, of art history and is not as well known as some of these other uh, artists of the Italian Renaissance or of Western Europe but it is considered the finest icon ever created within the Orthodox faith. It defined the template which has now been copied for centuries. He was the first Russian artist to incorporate a delicateness and emotion to his figures, especially, specifically the angels within the Trinity. That's again what, what really changed the course of icon painting is that he brought a delicateness, a humanness, and emotion to his figures which had not been duplicated previously. He was a modest Orthodox monk who never traveled outside of Moscow. His only influence would have been the training he received from Theophanes the Greek, who was taught the Novgorod tradition of icon painting. This was the renaissance of Russian Orthodox icons prior to the Moscow school. So after this renaissance of, Ru of Rublev and of him influencing his peers, um, there, there kind of was this kind of lessening of work, uh, which became the Moscow School. Not that it's not equally important, but there, it wasn't the, the, what I would call the game changer that uh, Rublev, along with his predecessors, created with the Novgorod tradition. Next slide. Masaccio's Trinity is also considered uh, one of the first and one of the finest examples of early Renaissance painting in Florence. Um, this altarpiece in particular uh, really played a integral role in terms of showing other artists all the way to artists such as Michelangelo, uh, da Vinci, even Brunelleschi in terms of being an architect, being, under, being able to understand perspective on a two-dimensional surface. Masaccio was able to grasp that as, as a very young artist and duplicate that in his works. It created a template for later artists, uh, which I mentioned, Michelangelo and da Vinci, to learn perspective within a two-dimensional plane. Um, as I mentioned before, Michelangelo did apprentice in Santa Maria Novella as a young artist, as well as several other artists, uh, Botticelli um, as well. Um, and so they were all influenced by this altarpiece. Masaccio, similar to Rublev, also incorporated a humanness to his figures that defined the later Renaissance. The delicateness and emotion found in his figures, as well as the draperies, were unique of his time and comparable to Rublev's. So the reason why I tie these two together is that 
these two artists on opposite ends of, of countries, you know, one being in Florence, Italy, the other being in Moscow, it had no connection between themselves, but yet really were very similar in how they approached their work. Next slide. It is truly remarkable that two artists were so isolated yet created such revolutionary works of art that became templates for the artistic traditions they defined and established. But it is even more inspiring that both artists broke from, this, from their, these historic traditions of their predecessors, uh, Masaccio's being Giotto and Rublev's being Theophanes the Greek, and forge a new style that brought a humanness and emotion to the figure which had not been illustrated previously to that on a two-dimensional surface. Next slide. So I close with this. So these are two images uh, of Christ. Uh, the image on the left is by Andrei Rublev, Christ the Savior, from roughly 1410, uh, which is located at the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow. The other is a uh, cropped in version of Christ from Masaccio's The Tribute Money. The Tribute Money is a uh, image that's connected within the Brancacci Chapel in Florence. It's created around 1425, the same time period that the Trinity was. The Brancacci Chapel has several images from the, um, from the Bible, and uh, this image of Christ, and looking at the image of Rublev, you, you, you see that humanness that they were able to capture. In the, in the portrait of Christ. And that, that is all I have for this evening. <laughs> now I do have one last thing I wanted to mention, um, and it's something that when I was studying the Old Testament Trinity by Rublev, um, it was suggested that I, that I, that I study this as well. Um, there's a film that was produced in 1966 by the great Russian uh, director Andrei Tarkovsky, um, which is titled uh, Rublev. And it's a highly influential film uh, within just cinema as a whole. Um, the way it was filmed, the symbolism, um, it's really remarkable. Now, the one thing I will preface is it's about four and a half hours long. <laughs> and it's also completely in Russian. Um, so, um, so in that capacity, um, it's, you got to kind of chip away at it. Um, but I've, I've watched it several times. Um, it's, it's not a direct interpretation. Tarkovsky is not a theologian either. But it's filled with a monumental amount of symbolism. And I think that from watching that movie, you get a grasp of kind of the world in which Rublev lived. Um, uh, what Tarkovsky tried to do was film, create a film that, that genuinely um, depicted medieval Russia at the time of Rublev's life. And he, you know, films this movie so that Rublev kind of follows in the footsteps of Christ. There's some references to the life of Christ in the movie. Um, and, and I think there's some poignancy that you could almost even, even kind of envision Tarkovsky as an icon painter in a, in a cinematographic way. Um, and so if, if any of you are intrigued by Russian icons, I would highly encourage you to watch that because it, again, I think it brings a lot to the table. Um, sadly, when it was created, it was um, censored within most of Russia and kind of fell through the cracks. And so it sort of gained some momentum within uh, Western Europe and also within the U.S. at the time. Uh, now it's pretty easy to find and is fairly accessible. But um, it, again, um, you know, at the time uh, really was, uh, was a profound example of Russian film. And his hope was to, again, put Rublev on the map like many of these uh, uh, major artists of the Renaissance and, and earlier. So, um, I guess it's called, it's called Rublev, and it was uh, produced in 1966 by Andrei Tarkovsky, T-A-R-K-O-V-S-K-Y. Yeah, and, and the other is there are certain like little segments of it that you can watch, you know, uh, rather than the whole thing. But um, 
the the whole movie if you watch if you do watch it, it it's profoundly amazing and and really ties to uh, the heritage of icon painting uh, from painting icons to uh, the way that they're created uh, within churches to then also how they're cast uh, as as metal uh, traveling icons. Um, are there questions? Uh, do uh, all Orthodox churches have works of art? Yes, and one thing that I mention, um, and I and I had the the blessing to study in Moscow and also Saint Petersburg and go into a lot of these churches. And one thing, and I, I don't know if it's possible here at Trinity, but icons are meant to be seen under candlelight, and when you're able to see them under candlelight, and the light of the candle flickers within the gold of the of the image. Uh, there's a, a spirituality there, an aesthetic that is pretty remarkable. Um, so again, I don't know if you're having any midnight masses in the near future, but um, but it, it, uh, yeah. So um, yes, all the churches, and and again, when you go into these churches, much like in Italy or Western Europe, um, the scale of the works on the walls are monumental. I mean, floor to ceiling, nothing but icons. Other questions? So you've had a chance to look through the exhibit here, you said numerous, several times. So does this sound like a fair question? Is there, are there some icons that would emphasize more of what you've just talked about as opposed to some of the others? I, I haven't spent that much time with the exhibit yet. So most of what is through the exhibition are mainly images of the Mother of God as well as the life of Christ. Those are the two themes. And that obviously is the majority of, I, of icon templates that are there. Um, there's obviously, if you, if you get encyclopedias on icon painting, there's all kinds of templates for the rarest of saints and these very odd stories. Um, one work of our, I, I'm a visual artist as well, and one work that I was drawn to and created was one that, was, that referenced uh, the icon of the seven sleepers. And these were these seven uh, martyrs that were found in a cave. And, like completely rare, like you just don't see it very often. Um, so in terms of, of interpreting this exhibition, what I think is very helpful is that she interplays con, uh, contemporary templated icons, the ones that look like a historic icon with her own work. And, and she's quoted on one of those panels saying that she's not an icon painter, which she isn't because she is interpreting these in a very contemporary way. So in the, I think the next lecture where you're bringing in an actual icon painter who writes icons, they follow a template very religiously. Uh, she's following her faith much more creatively. And so both, they're equally important, but I think seeing them in conjunction to one another, just like seeing her contemporary installation in your smaller chapel, I think it's so profound to see these works from an Eastern tradition within a very um, Protestant uh, setting. I, I think that, that that can really provoke uh, a lot of your own personal faith in terms of how you interpret these works. She has a lot of emphasis on the eyes too. Yes, and when you look at icons, like if you look at these two, your eyes, or your eyes are drawn to their eyes and they, they act as portals and that's part of the connection between artist and viewer or subject and viewer. Other questions? Um, I had one other, although I've heard you talk before, uh, and not to get too personal, and I know your background quite a bit, but um, how, how has all this study helped your spiritual life, or is that not a right kind of question to ask in this environment? But so Jerry is asking, so as I kind of prefaced, I'm also a visual artist, and a lot of my work always ties to my own faith. and. He asked, you know, how this engages my own work, my own, my own creativity, and, and I incorporate gold into my own work for very spiritual reasons as well, um, and how it relates to us as, as worshipers of our own, you know, within uh, the Christian faith. Um, but I think that to really go into that and how deep that is, I, that's a whole nother, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but I will say that icons in particular 
have always had a profound impact on how I design my picture planes, how I embed gold into my work, and the artist here, uh, pa Pawlowski, uh, same deal, uh, Pawlowska, um, same deal. I mean, she's incredibly influenced by the history, tradition, sanctity of icons, and that em embeds itself into her work. If you have any further questions, please, I'll, I'll be around for a few minutes and I'm happy to answer them, but thank you again for your attention. Thank you. Well, it's great to have been with you. We hope you have the opportunity to go through the exhibit if you have not already, or if not this evening, to take the video and come back and to spend some time. It is here through September 10th, which means you can come back again. And if there's something you want to come back again to see, it, is, it has the benefit of being open to the public. You're not paying for admission. So come back and be <laughs> with us. And but it's open tonight till 8. And it's open till 8 until 8 o'clock. So come on back. Uh, as Justin did note, there is going to be another program on August 18th. August 18th, about the traditional art of icons. And, and the right, the proper word to say is writing, because again, yes, this is not just visual art, it is a spiritual exercise for those who participate in this. So they speak of writing an icon as you would write a Bible, writing scripture, writing scripture. So plan on coming back and being with us at that point as well. Great to have you with us and look forward to seeing you soon.